Chapter 1 The pale orange glow from the security lights out in the yard filtered through the bars and wire mesh into the cell. A dog snuffled under the window until its handler called. He called softly so it was early. He padded away and then the clock struck. Three times it reverberated like Joshua's trumpet, but it didn't knock down the walls or even tell the time. Of all the clocks in the world, the one above the gate in Durham Jail is the most aggravating. Months it had taken me to solve the code. It had just clanged three, so the next time would be either one for quarter past three or the hour of something else. Standing at the tidy, heavily barred window, naked and clammy, looking at the stars, twinkling a million light years away and listening intently for the clock to strike again. The conversation I'd had with the governor came to mind from yesterday. He said I wasn't good enough to go into the main prison, but there wasn't anything he could do to prevent me being discharged, inferring he'd like to keep me in forever. He was a little, portly, arrogant fellow, with snow-white hair and the dress sense of a mad budgie, and for all of his bluff and bluster, he was a rank coward at heart. He liked to keep me as much as I'd like to stay. Three years ago, I told him one morning during his rounds that if we'd been on a desert island, I'd be the governor, and he'd be getting me coconuts, and he would have to be lively about it. Well, we're not on a desert island, he smirked, squinting through the screws, like a hooker in a rugby scrum. It's a good job for you we're not. A little officious prick like him wouldn't last a minute without the system, giving him backing, telling him what to do. Anyway, I'd more to think about than the likes of him. I could think about Pauline, for instance. My wife. The clanging of the clock in the middle of the night always brought on evil thoughts of her, and I hadn't thought about her for a while now. Very soon I'd have to see her, if I wanted to see my little lad. It would mean being nice when really I'd like to sling her off the cliffs at Flamborough Head. But I had to see the lad. He'd be three in July. And according to my sister, he's a little beauty, with enough energy to occupy a hundred nurses. I'd married his mother a week before. I'd been arrested, after knowing each other about two months. She'd come on a day trip to Blackpool, met me, and didn't go back. It was the story of her life. She'd left home at fifteen, and had been living in a house in Cheadle Hume, Manchester, shared with five other young kids, and on the sick when we met, she was twenty, and I was twenty-seven. She didn't give a fuck for anybody or anything, but herself and me. She wore two-piece suits in bright pastel colours, lemon, pink, sky blue, and with her short white hair and flashing teeth, she was the sexiest bird I'd ever seen. Stripped off, she had the body of a middleweight fighter all bunches of smooth muscle, and she was so strong she could prevent me from fucking her just by contracting certain muscles. She had herself a job the first day on a t-shirt print stall, had half a dozen printed with her name on, and packed the job in to start another job next door, this time selling hot dogs and beef burgers and earning four times more money. She turned my little flat into a home and guarded it like a mother hen. Didn't give me any pressure at all, not until I've been arrested. And that's all she's given me since. Pressure and pressure and more pressure. Until six months ago, when I'd called it a day. She couldn't have been better off living with my parents while I'd been in, I'd thought. But after two weeks, she'd gone out one day and didn't come back. Three weeks later, she turned up in her town of origin, Bolton. She came back to Wakefield, my hometown, and then turned up in Blackpool a month or two later. The only letters I received were asking for money for her and the baby, with no explanations at all. At the time we'd married, she thought she was pregnant. In fact, she'd told the judge she was, but I hadn't been sure. She had the baby in Blackpool, and I arranged to be transferred from here to Liverpool jail to make it easier to visit. She brought the baby, a boy she called Paul, a couple of times, and then sent another dear John, about the eighth. The prison padre in Liverpool was very understanding, said it was probably postnatal depression, and arranged a visit. Pauline sailed into his office with Paul on one bulging arm and a huge shopping bag on the other. At the end, I asked her why she brought the bag and why she kept her arm in all the time. 
she pulled out a carving knife big enough to cut off an elephant's leg, and said, in case you started, and waved it under my nose. The padre had almost collapsed. A week later she moved back to Wakefield and was given another council house. The last of my money set up a home like one it took my mother twenty years to make, according to the letter mother had sent. Not long afterwards, my mate's wife sent in a report that Pauline was taking a different fellow home from the local pub every dinner time. So I stopped writing altogether then. She moved to Bolton, leaving a £286 rent bill, and then came back to Wakefield a year later, no doubt owing rent in Bolton, but was given yet another council house, and Mother sent me her address. She answered my letter by return post, and I started having thoughts of settling down to life as a married man with a little lad. A steady job on some building site shouldn't be a problem. Now I had my city and guilds in Brick Lane, and I'd keep in trim with weightlifting. I'd forget about her sleeping about. Thou won't wear it out, my old mate Norm had said, philosophically. I wish I had a pair of buits, Medart and one. The next letter she sent told me she was pregnant, and regardless of what I had to say, she was keeping it. That was the final straw. She was a slag, and the nights I'd laid awake solving the code of the gatehouse clock had been a waste of time. My feelings for her were dead beyond recovery. The clock struck one, two, and didn't stop until it reached six. Six o'clock. Thursday, 3rd of March, 1977. Six o'clock, and enough time left for a brew before the door opened. The kettle was ready, a marvel-powered milk tin but now it contained water, and was hanging from a length of mail bag twine from my three-cornered washstand, and underneath, in the lid of a shoe-polished tin, was the wick, two pats of prison margarine squashed into a scrap of prison vest. Normally, I'd take great care to centre the wick under the tin precisely to prevent it smoking, and decreasing the risk the screws might get a whiff of it, but it was too late now. I didn't give a toss if they smelt it or not, Dawn had broken over the women's wing, across the yard, and the high-mast security lights had been switched off by the time the water boiled. With the tea made, the kettle cleaned, and all the evidence removed, I dressed, packed my kit, folded the bedding, and settled down to wait. What would the little governor say, if he could see me now, I thought, settling on the bunk? After the incident with the carving knife, I realised my good behaviour had been in vain and the screws were taken advantage, pushing to see how far I would go. It cost me eight months' remission to rectify matters, and I was transferred back here to Durham, which coincided with Pauline's latest move to Wakefield. Although I'd been thinking very seriously of getting a job, I didn't really want one. Stuck on a building site, wearing wellies and a donkey jacket wasn't for me. But what else could I do? And I wasn't much of a weightlifter either, I realised after I'd seen the mighty Russian, Vasily Alexeyev, win the gold medal at last year's Olympics. On real good days, I could manage about three hundred pounds, whereas he could manage five hundred and seventy-two pounds. Going back to my cell after watching him, the screw had given me Pauline's letter telling me she was pregnant. The following day I'd seen Theophilo Stevenson win the gold medal in the heavyweight boxing, and thought an amateur like him, couldn't beat me, while ever he had a hole in his ass, and decided to have one more go for a license. By now I was thirty, but I was supremely fit, strong, and knew how to box, but I'd been refused a professional license once already, four years ago. A week or two, after I'd seen the Olympics, I'd been brought down here, segregated under Rule 43, for the good order and discipline of the prison when I'd been looking through an old copy of the boxing news and seen exactly what I'd been looking for. Tommy Miller's address. It was like a sign from God. Tommy Miller had told me four years ago I wouldn't be granted a license unless I signed with him. And he'd been right, even though I'd already had a manager. Back then, when he more or less threatened me, I hadn't given a toss if I'd been refused a license or not, because I'd been all signed up to go and fight in the States on a sponsorship. So I told him to piss off, and not without good reason, too. A few months before I'd finished a five-year sentence, which I'd served in Hull Jail, 
the prison Lord Mountbatten had recommended all the difficult prisoners in the system should be detained. I'd been there about nine months when somebody had found two pairs of battered old sparring gloves hidden away in the gym. In no time at all, boxing became one of the main sports in the nick. Right from being a little lad, I'd been trained in the noble art, and I'd had heaps of amateur bouts, winning schoolboy and junior titles galore. A month later, one Saturday afternoon, out of the blue, a fella turns up with a big black American professional called Freddie Mac, with a one-round KO victory over Jack Bordell, who was then the British heavyweight champion. He didn't have a cat in hell's chance. And not long afterwards, the fella, Mr Alex Steen, brought in Ray Patterson, Floyd's brother, and Frankie Taylor, the boxing correspondent of the people. The following Sunday, Frankie Taylor tipped me to be the next British champion, after watching me flatten Ray. On my home leave, Alex arranged for me to spar in the Thomas Beckett gym in the old Kent Road, before Frank Butler of the News of the World. He agreed with Frankie Taylor, but the publicity did nothing to persuade the parole board to give me early release. The minute I had been released, I entered the National Amateur Championships, the ABAs, and reached my national semi-finals. Before I'd started, the organisers had told me my sort wasn't welcome and the first person that went the distance would win on points. That's exactly what happened. Immediately Alex arranged with Yancey Durham, the manager of Bob Foster, the current world light heavyweight champion, and Joe Frazier, who'd just lost the world heavyweight title to George Foreman, for me to spar with Joe at the Empire Ballroom, Leicester Square, where he was training publicly to fight Joe Bugner. After two weeks of standing toe to toe, no quarter asked and none given, I'd impressed Yancey so much, he wanted to take me back to the States with him. There and then, Alex said, providing I wasn't given a licence to box over here, I'd be over. When Tommy had come to the beach, where I'd been working as a lifeguard, in an effort to convince people I was all straight and above board, I'd been waiting for the answer to my application for a licence. Tommy had been right, but I wasn't bothered, and arrangements went ahead for me to fly out to Philadelphia. Thirteen days before I was due to go, the news came over Yancey had dropped dead of a heart attack. I packed the job in and went across the promenade to mind half a dozen mock auction shops for ten times more money. It was during this period that I had met Pauline. At the end of the season, with a pal of mine, we'd robbed a bookmaker's accountant of the week's takings from thirty-two betting shops, and an hour later, there had been a general alert for our arrests. That was three years and four months ago, and four months ago I'd written to Tommy and told him if he could get me a licence. I'd earn us both a bucketful of money when I was released. Less than a week after receiving my letter, he came to visit me with his son, young Tommy, a skinny, bald, silent fellow about my age. Tommy made all kinds of arrangements with the prison welfare and doctor to try and get me a licence so I could box on this show at Liverpool Stadium on Saturday, March 5th, where John Conte was defending his world title. He wanted me to fight Leon Spinks, last year's gold medalist in the light heavyweight division at the Montreal Olympics. But the most he had been able to manage was the promise of a licence in six months, if I behaved myself and stayed out of trouble. He told me to turn up on Saturday because he got me a job as a security man in the dressing-room area, but Alex had got me a ticket and asked me to sit with him. Tommy wouldn't like it, but I couldn't give a toss if he liked it or not. If Alex didn't tell the judge at Teesside Crown what rotten diabolical look I'd had, I wouldn't be out for at least another three years, and if Tommy and his pals hadn't refused me a licence, I wouldn't have been in here in the first place. Saturday I'd be sitting with Alex, and Tommy could look after the dressing rooms himself. It would be hard at first. It always was, coming out of the nick after a few years, but this time it would be harder than ever, going home to live for the first time since I was eighteen, with the old man retired and mother and my baby sister. Baby sister, that was a laugh. In her latest letter, she'd bragged how easily she'd passed the driving test first time, and she had gotten herself engaged to be married. She'd be eighteen on my thirty-first birthday in two months, but she'd only been four when I'd last lived at home. Now her and mother were standing markets all over the show. 
Once I'd used up the adrenaline, and I could eat, sleep, shit, stay in one place for more than twenty minutes, and my temper came off a hair trigger, maybe then I could settle into something with them. The thing I had to do was take my time, and just get through this six months, until I started boxing, because if I didn't, I'd be in the nick for the rest of my life, and I couldn't bear the thought. Cons, on the whole, were the silliest bastards of them all, and to think I was one of them made my blood boil. No wonder I preferred it behind my door out of the way. There was an inch of tea remaining when a brand new screw opened the door. The cell was totally bare, but for the poster advertising the Conte fight on Saturday stuck on the wall behind the door. The next fella in the cell could have a look at it, but knowing this mob, he'd probably roll it up and smoke it. Are you ready, then? the screw asked, smiling nervously and peering in disbelief at the steam rising from the pot. Yeah, I'm ready, I smiled reassuringly. In fact, I've been ready well over three years. What's in the pot? he inquired. Tea, boss. Look, I held it under his nose. It was strong and sweet, and if he liked tea, he'd love this. Where did you get it from? He was totally baffled. The chief, I answered airily, brings me a pot every morning. Old pals, you know, me and the chief. The whole nick was still locked up, even the con who made the screws tea, as I walked along the wings to the reception. At the junction of D and B wings, where the centre box stood, the day shift were reading their work detail boards and hoping they'd been picked for a good job. They all studiously kept their backs to me as I skipped down the steps to B1 landing and on to the reception. The whole nick was silent, as if I was on my way to the topping shed instead of being discharged. Cons in every cell, huddled under the bedding, trying to keep another day at bay for as long as possible. Not me. I'd always made it a point to be up and ready, washed and shaved and full of life. It frightened the screws to death. They'd got their own back in their own crackpot fashion, with silly aggravating little strokes like they'd done in the reception last September. The Nick doctor said I had to go to Dryburn Hospital for an X-ray, and when I'd come to put my clothes on, I'd found the trousers of my suit had been slashed to ribbons. It cost the Nick sixty-eight pounds, and all the screws in the reception had been severely reprimanded. Whoever did it thought I'd discover them this morning. After a quick bath in lukewarm water, with a screw aching to tell me to get out, I dressed carefully, debated all the time whether to demand breakfast or not. No, I decided. If I do, the bastards will keep me hanging about ages, and I didn't want anything to eat just yet anyway. Come and sign for your cash, the P.O. said, forcing a smile. We can let you out then before the others come. Passing the admin block, I caught a glimpse of myself in the windows. I looked much better than I was feeling. My clothing seemed to be made of canvas, stiff and heavy. The little, brand new screw, who'd been with me all the way, had a face like a bad ham, as if he wished he was being discharged. Like the screws in the gate lodge, he didn't speak, smile, or even look at me, as I was let in one side and out of the other. The Judas gate slammed behind me. We don't want your sort in here, it said plain as day. They didn't like me in Durham, and I didn't like them, and the Judas gate could stay shut forever. Go on, you daft cunts, I thought. Lock yourselves in. Their stupidity amazed me at times. Stepping forward and turning round, I looked for the clock, only to see to my astonishment, there wasn't one. There wasn't a gatehouse clock. It must be hidden, I decided so people like me couldn't smash it on their way out. Smack opposite the gates was a little park full of evergreen trees, shrubs, bushes, and floating in the tops of the trees were streamers. They looked to be made of cotton wool. For a minute I stood and wondered what it could be, and then remembered the river on three sides of the city. It was mist, and for it to be so white the river had to be clean and fresh and unpolluted. It was magical, and I'd never seen anything remotely like it. Walking from the gate to the red and white pole on the border of prison property, I inhaled deep breaths of the mild, damp air, and was amazed at the powerful scent from the trees and shrubs. My clothing didn't feel comfortable at all. It felt solid enough to stop bullets, and I had the beginning of a trickle of sweat at the bottom of my back. 
ducking under the pole, I couldn't help but notice two family groups waiting for sons and lovers, all with their faces etched deep with malice, looking with hostility in my direction, all but one fella who was studying the sky directly above his head, as though he'd never seen it before, and trying to whistle. He may have been a fisherman from South Shields, looking to see how the weather would be for when the boat comes in, but I didn't really think so. They all thought I was a governor, because I wore a three-piece pinstripe suit, or if not a governor, then somebody to do with why their billy was locked up. Halfwits like them couldn't solve the crossword in the sun, and here they were assuming I was the enemy. The fella looking at the sky didn't want the blame for the expression on his wife's face. My clothes began to feel better as I became used to them, and I realised like me they only wanted breaking in. The fresh air was wonderful. The perfume from the trees. The silence. There wasn't any traffic for miles, it seemed, and the bounce in my step was wonderful. Everything was wonderful, and spring was definitely in the air after a long, hard winter. Should I do a right or keep straight on? If I did a right, I'd have to walk past the police station, and I didn't want to see a copper this morning. It would spoil everything seeing a copper. It would be worse than seeing a magpie. The decision to keep straight on had just been made, when a car engine suddenly roared into life, shattering the peace and tranquillity, and scaring a flock of sparrows from the guttering of the nearest building. The car came racing towards me as sparrows skimmed my head like tracer bullets. For an instant I thought the car was going to hit me, but it swerved at the very last moment and screeched to a halt at my side. The driver's window was open, and a familiar black face with a huge grin on it said, Now then, brother, Del Nip lively from the car, shook my hand, welcomed me back into the world of the living, and then ordered me to get in the back and let's be off. Without a word I did as I'd been told, and found I was sitting next to a girl with skin the colour of milky coffee, and eyes that said she'd just woken up. In the front was Davy Dunford. He showed me thirty-two big white teeth in his characteristic grin, and nodded. And then Dell set off, as though we'd just done a smash and grab. Dell had been my pal for two sentences, and all the time in between. He's short, and looks nothing much in clothing, but when he strips off you can't believe your eyes. He's massive, with masses of thick, hard muscle. He's handsome, too, a dead ringer for Ken Norton. He doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, and trains almost every day. A good, clean-living boy, with his only flaw being a terribly strong leaning towards smooth-skinned, fair-haired white boys, a tendency he doesn't deny. He's twenty-seven, and lives with a bird in Liverpool, a pretty intelligent white girl, who's just seen him through a four-year sentence, with regular visits and three or four long interesting letters every week. I wasn't sure if she was aware of his sexual inclinations, but I should think she was. Her name is Karen, and she'd lived at my parents with Pauline a few years ago, while Dell had been serving his sentence, jointly charged with Davy, and he'd finished about six months ago. Karen came to visit with Eunice, that's Davy's sister, just after Christmas. A nice, pleasant visit with two attractive girls. It was a pleasant break from the cell. I didn't know Davy all that well. I'd only met him in Durham last year. A short, fair-haired kid from Sheffield, who wasn't a bad footballer, and not a bad weightlifter either. At first I'd thought he was one of Dell's boys, but he wasn't. He has a girl. In fact, he's had the same girl since she was fourteen, and she's twenty-two now. He'd been across the landing from me, until a week before Christmas, and the day he'd been released, he'd sent me in his radio. Mine had broken, and with only having a few months left, I'd not bothered about it. He sent me his without having to ask. A nice gesture I really appreciated. Who was the girl in the corner, then? She must be for me, if she wasn't Dell's or Davy's. She was huddled inside a blue great coat, with a brown ski cap pulled down to her ears. She was gorgeous, absolutely. Her skin looked so warm and smooth I wanted to kiss her and looked for a place to do so. Her lips were long and full, with a bottom lip promising a store of latent passion. Her nostrils were the same, two almond shapes that would flex in ecstasy, and her eyes, two velvet brown orbs in a sea of pearl that would close to prolong the pleasure. 
She smiled without any warmth, her eyes wary, showed milk-white teeth, and then looked out of the window. Who was I kidding, I thought, remembering I had to find a paper shop, and noticing Dell's driving for the first time. He was concentrating on finding the way out of the town to the A1, without letting anybody overtake us. We zoomed down streets, round roundabouts, stopping with jerks, and starting with more G-force than a big dipper. Slow down, Dell, I said. I've got to find a paper shop. I promised to send some magazines in to a kid. There isn't one, Davy answered, twisting in the seat. I looked at my zen when I came out. He said before he'd been discharged, he would send some mags. But he hadn't. He'd sent the radio instead. Well, slow down a bit, just in case one's opened, he grinned. In fact, he was always grinning. It was his answer to everything. A huge grin that looked like the cliffs of Dover. It used to drive the screws barmy, and occasionally me too. He'd not seen a paper shop, but I doubt he'd looked, because there had to be one somewhere. The promise I'd made had taken precedence over the bird in the corner. Going home, stabbing images of Pauline, all the conglomeration of random thoughts I'd been having were blotted out with finding a paper shop. I'd made a promise. I regretted it now, but I'd made it, and I'd stay in Durham until it had been fulfilled. Besides, I wanted to look around and arrive home this afternoon. At this rate, I'd be home before anybody was out of bed. Do a right here, Dell, I ordered, sticking my hand before his face and indicating with jerks. Here, do a right, Dell. If you don't shift your hand, I'll crash, he said, and then screeched. One of Dell's mad laughs. He had dozens of them, every one unique. My hand had filled his vision like a brick wall. Pulling it back and feeling stupid, I realised how much I liked him, had always liked him, and for him to be outside the gates at 6.30 this morning, he had to like me. I was with friends, and it would take some getting used to. He did a right, and sure enough, we found a paper shop. Who's the papers for? Davy asked as we entered. Alan Forbes, a young kid from Ellesmere Port. I was toed up with him last year. Oh yeah, I know him, being Shanghai'd from Lancaster. It had been over six months since I'd made the promise in the cell one night. He didn't smoke or snore, and his feet didn't smell. He trained on the weights and everything else, and for a young kid he was good company. I'd told him all about Pauline, and having one last shot at a boxing licence, all the hopes and fears that I normally wouldn't tell a soul. He was a good listener, and always came up with a sensible answer. His advice on my future love life was to get myself a schoolie, and he'd given me a copy of the boxing news, just in case, a million to one shot, I'd find what I was looking for. I'd found Tommy's address, which had given me a profound feeling of gratitude that I wanted to repay. Besides sending him a few weightlifting mags, I promised to pick him up and take him home when he was discharged in six weeks' time, just as Dell was doing with me. The bird in the car wasn't a schoolie, but not much older, maybe, I don't know, maybe eighteen. It was hard to tell the way she was wrapped up. She was still huddled in the corner as we set off again, at a more leisurely speed. It was a type of car I'd not seen before, a model that had come out while I'd been in. And Dell was dressed up like I'd not seen him before either. He could easily pass for the Nigerian ambassador at the National Congress. Anita Paul, Dell announced, without taking his eyes from the road. Not a chance of crashing with him driving, but he'd need a new car every six months. He'd revved up and braked in a series of mad dashes and sudden stops in the town, but now we were on the air one, we were overtaking other vehicles as though they were parked at the side of the road. It was the first time I'd sampled his driving, although we'd been in plenty of cars together, but I'd always been the driver. This car was on hire, he told me, and he passed the test since being released. He had a car on hire permanently. He needed one for his business, importing vegetation from his father's homeland of Nigeria. He drove exactly like he did anything, short, intense bursts of maximum effort and sudden stops. He was the only fella I'd ever met who could equal my circuit times, and he didn't have to train with anywhere near the intensity that I had to. He didn't need to, because he was naturally so fucking strong. He's only five foot five and weighed thirteen stone. A twenty-eight waist and twenty-eight thighs, a chest like a golf course and arms like knotted tow rope, and was far older than his years. Sometimes his wisdom made him seem ancient. 
He was the quickest learner I'd ever come across, but soon lost interest when he thought he'd learnt sufficient to get him through without making a fool of himself. Occasionally, he'd think he was an expert when he'd only scraped the top off a subject, or he'd learnt enough to discover the subject bored him, but on a subject like chess, the rules and the object of the game, he was easily the quickest and best player I knew. He was the best chess player a week after he'd been shown the game. Dell was bright, quick and self-educated, and he'd just remembered his manners. So her name is Anita. Sleep sweeter with Anita, and I'd like to very much. She was tall, about five foot ten, and her calves were perfect. Her legs were bare and her shoes were flat. And as she walked towards the entrance of the Scots Corner Hotel, where Dell was treating me to breakfast, I hope you had brought her for me. She was beautiful. Davy had on jeans and a nylon zip-up jacket, with shoes looking as though they'd been designed for snow. Welts like dodgem cars, presumably the latest fashion. Dell wore the grey striped trousers, black jacket and waistcoat of a morning suit. Obviously, the years he'd spent poring over the William Hickey column had taken effect. How he'd love a mention one of these days, the Hunt Ball or a point-to-point, -point, Squire Darkey from Liverpool 8. He would be treasured by his staff and tenants, loved and cherished for his wisdom and fair play. The times he'd told me in the nick, he thought the system that had been preventing me from boxing was crooked and arrogant, and nobody was more satisfied than he that I was being given a chance at last. It's not right you should have to wait six months, though. He chewed on a slice of rubbery toast. I mean, anything could happen in six months. We were seated in the breakfast room around a small table festooned with little jugs and toast racks. There wasn't room for another salt pot, and bringing each other up to date with our fortunes and intentions. And Dell had threatened the management with a lawsuit if they didn't bring him porridge. Damn it all, he'd snapped at the waiter. Porridge is the traditional breakfast of the Englishman, part of his constitution. His shoulders hunched under his jacket, rippling like an earth tremor, and a thick vein throbbed in his neck. He was warming up for a fight. He was so incredibly strong, he didn't have to know how to fight. He just walked in and screwed them up like paper bags. Throwing the table and the waiter through the wall wouldn't be any problem. Bring me porridge! he continued to the terrified waiter, or you'll be hearing from my counsel and a lawsuit will be the result. Not his solicitor, but his counsel. Who that could be, I'd no idea. But it sounded ominous, a bit like his stare and bulging neck. He'd eaten the porridge and declared it delicious, in a loud voice across the room to where the waiter was standing recovering from the shock. Bloody delicious, old chap. Just the stuff, he called, and added in a whisper, it was fucking lousy, watery and had lumps. It was instant crap. I didn't doubt it. It was all instant. Little pats of margarine individually wrapped and plastic containers of milk, all bits and pieces of instant service. What do you think, Davy? Do you think it's a liberty, the board of control, making me wait six months before I can earn a living? Oh, you'll get a living, I should think. He gave me one of his stupid grins as if to say making a living was a trivial matter. I know I shall make a living, but that's not the point. The point is, who do they think they are passing a sentence when I've done nothing, the fucking slag bastards? Here I was a free man, and a self-elected body of whom Tommy was part, said I had to behave myself before I could box. Where was the sense in that? Surely if I was boxing and earning a living, I'd far less chance of being in trouble than scratching my ass and waiting. What was the purpose of it? Unless Tommy wanted to see if my friendship with Alex was still evident. It was the only explanation I could think of, and I'd spent hours thinking about it. There'd been nobody on solitary to discuss it with, and now, at the first opportunity, I'd exploded as if I was a Neanderthal man sighting a mammoth. Suddenly I became aware of my surroundings, and Anita's startled expression. Sorry, love. I smiled ruefully. I was forgetting where I was. She showed lovely white teeth, and two dimples appeared in her cheeks. Dell had finished the toast and was eating another slice. This one with marmalade. I'll show you this flat on Saturday. He wiped crumbs fastidiously from his lips before he continued. I'm sure you'll like it. Your own bedroom, but you'll have to share the rest. You'll be all right. They're two friends of mine. 
until that moment I'd forgotten I'd asked him weeks ago to find me somewhere to live, until I'd become used to being free. He knew all about Pauline and the fact she'd had another baby. He didn't like her much before, but he detested her now, and thought she was the reason I'd asked. He wasn't aware I'd asked my parents about living at home. The news of a flat was good news indeed. Friends of yours, Dell, I said sceptically. Davy laughed at Dell's outraged expression, and Anita looked from one to the other in puzzlement. It seemed everybody but her knew of Dell's sexual inclinations. Could it be there was something between them after all? We came down the Air One through Leeds to Wakefield, where we parked behind the stalls of the market on a purpose-built car park. It was brand new and very handy if you were a stall holder like Mother and Kay. They were both swathed in bonnets and scarves and much too busy to pay much attention to me. To kill time, the four of us had a walk around the new shopping precincts, the one that had always been hidden between high wooden fences when I'd been there before. It wasn't at all like I remembered. The streets had been widened, the cobbles removed, old dilapidated buildings demolished and new ones built. It was neat, clean and very modern. There wasn't a sign of dark satanic mills or the fact we were in the middle of the West Yorkshire coalfield. It was marvellous. Where Mother and Kay were standing the market, there used to be one up, one down terraced houses, each side of narrow cobble streets, and the market hall had been a derelict barn. Now it looked just like the new technical college. Spring was more than evident in the flower beds of the bull ring, and daffodils were all over the cathedral lawns. Everywhere was alive with colour and space, and lovely clean white concrete, no grime and muck at all. It seemed friendlier, too. There's some great shops, Dell said in amazement. Davy wanted a night out, and Anita was busy looking at the dress displays in the shop windows, and showing all Wakefield her dimples, and I had a strange feeling. It wasn't a Sheffield or Liverpool, but it had more class. In fourteen years the place had come from the last century and was almost into the next. I was proud this was my town. If what I'd been thinking came true, I'd put the place on the map. It was only ten-thirty when Dell pulled up outside the house and we'd been walking round town for an hour. Davy had asked if he could borrow a few quid. Only for a few days, he said, until something comes up. It was a pleasure to give it him, because it helped pay the debt I owed for the radio, although I'd given it back to him. I'd no fears he wouldn't pay me back, and I wasn't bothered if he did. The old fella, officially retired two months ago, was bent over the coffee table, studying the form for today's racing as I entered the living room. Chuffin' hell, Paul, he cried, leaping to his feet. I thought it was the coppers bursting in. He shook hands with Dell, nodded at Davy, he'd not met him before, and peered short-sightedly at Anita. How's Karen, Delroy? he asked immediately. OK, Walter, she sends her best. When you see your dad, Delroy, tell him to back a horse called Little Rascal every time it runs. Have you heard me? Little Rascal, Delroy. Little Rascal. What's it called? Little Rascal, Walter. That's it, little rascal. Now don't you forget to tell your dad, will you? He began to tell him it's family tree, owners, trainers. But Dell shut him up. Right, Walter, little rascal, I won't forget. It was good to see the old fellow was still as pedantic as ever. Dell had to take Davy back to Sheffield and be back in Liverpool for dinner time. On the pavement I asked him why he'd brought Anita. You like her, then? Like her? She's fucking gorgeous. Fix it for Saturday, Dell. He burst with a maniacal shriek, a lunatic witch-doctor who's just found the formula. Wait and see, he said, rolling his eyes, and then slipping into the car. See you Saturday, brother, he called, driving away. It was Saturday morning when I saw him again, on his own manor, Liverpool 8. We were going to some theatre for the midday wane for the Conte fight, and his brother Michael and a few of his pals were coming. We were sitting in the front room of a little terraced house just off Granby Street and discussing Conte's chances, passing time until the wane. It was good to see Michael after so long, a tall, very dignified fella who'd been across the landing from me in Hull. He was a natural athlete, didn't smoke or drink, loved classical music, Mozart and Beethoven were his favourites, and was a chess player of county standard. He'd been a friend before I'd met Dell. Seeing them together, nobody would ever think they were brothers. They were as different to look at as me. 
Michael had a ginger tint to his hair, much lighter skin and freckles, and very strong opinions about the rights and wrongs of everything. We'd had some belting arguments. It was from Michael I'd learned how it was to be black, and not just black, but the son of a chief. Their father, Mr. Samson Asawa, was a chief of the Zulu nation. He'd been a chef aboard some ship all his life, but he was still a chief. Every time a seaman from the Zulu nation docked in Liverpool, he had to pay his respects, and both Michael and Dell were very aware of their father's status in the community. This particular part of Liverpool was African, and all the lads in the room had African fathers, and theirs had the greater status. You could tell from that just looking and hearing them talk. Both of them had no wish to see Conte, and didn't care if he won or not, but they were coming to the win. The trouble with the Contes went back years, and had nothing to do with boxing. Something going back to Africa, I thought, in the car speeding through the city. It was over by the time we arrived, because we couldn't find anywhere to park, and then had to walk a mile through narrow, cobbled back alleys and side streets. Things Wakefield didn't have now, and it was just over, but there was heaps of activity on the stage where the scales were. In the stalls, journalists were writing notes, officials striding about, and Jerry Quarry speaking into a microphone for an American TV network. Quarry had fought twice for the world title and was the best white heavy for decades. Casually, I wandered over to see how I compared. He was a dangerous-looking fella, thick shoulders and chest, but not all that broad. He fitted into my theory spot on. All the way through the history of the heavyweight division, the champion has become bigger with each passing decade, and he was a heavy of the late 60s, early 70s, and just that bit smaller all round than me. Size made all the difference in punching power, and I wanted all the punching power possible if I was going to get anywhere at my age. I was on the ebb, not getting any worse, not getting any better, and the quicker I could knock them over, the longer I would last. Jerry Quarry was retired at the age I would start, and to have a chance of getting anywhere, then I had to have as many fights in as short a time as possible, and my age recovery isn't what it was. If we had the same recovery rate, that we have when we're ten, we'd live to be seven hundred years old. I could still do it with a bit of luck, I thought, leaving the place, and if I earned half of what Jerry Quarry had, I'd be more than happy. Alex was standing in the foyer as we arrived, wearing a white mac and his usual sinister black specks. Without them, his eyes turned the colour of brake lights. He was a dead ringer for Kirk Douglas, playing a gangster. He looked mean and menacing, he was with his usual entourage, a group of fellas who loved boxing. Mikey Connors saw me first, a fellow with a flower pitch outside Horban tube station, and one of Alex's regular pals. He'd been in Hull to see me with Alex a few times. He nodded, touched Alex on the arm, who turned to me. Hello, lad, he said, his face solemn. Here's your ticket, and this is... He introduced me to his pals. When we came to a huge, elderly black fellow, he said... And this is Joe Gantz. You've heard of him. Right, you'll be sitting next to Joe. Three nights ago I'd been undressing for my final night in the chalky block, and now I was going to be sitting right next to arguably the best heavyweight of his day. My sister couldn't be more pleased, sitting next to Woody, out of the Bay City Rollers. Alex never failed to amaze me with the people he knew, but fighters were his favourites. He loved and respected fighters and thought they all needed protecting. In his opinion, promoters exploited fighters until they were finished, and then left them high and dry. The board of control had just refused him a promoter's license again, and Tommy said it was because they reckoned he was a bad influence. He'd already had one promotion without official backing, which had been a huge success, and was considering another. Tommy had advised me to terminate our friendship. Alex said it was wise to pretend we had, until I was underway, and then it didn't matter. Before we could present our tickets, Tommy came through the door, from the arena, smack into our intended path. He was wearing a powder-blue evening suit and smoking a short, very thick cigar. He noticed Alex, then me, and almost swallowed it. He recovered instantly and smiled self-consciously. This is Alex, Tommy, I said, with a disarming smile. 
I've told you all about him. A good friend of mine. And Alex, this is Tommy, my future manager. You've a good lad there, Tommy, Alex said. Looked after properly. He'll go all the way. He shook Tommy's hand. Oh, he'll get his chance, Tommy said quickly, providing he looks after himself and stays out of trouble. He appeared embarrassed. Out of his depth. This is where I'll be sitting if you want me, Tom. He peered at the number on the ticket. Glad of the distraction. Right, right. He nodded at the assembly. Scars and sideburns evident everywhere like Bluebeard's crew. He swallowed. Right then, see you later. And disappeared the way he'd come. Any independent observers watching this little drama would have been under the illusion Tommy had been frightened, terrified out of his skin but they'd have been wrong. Alex gave the likes of Tommy a guilt complex, and it was this that caused him to act the way he had. All his managerial career, he'd been overmatching his lads, slipping them in to fill up the bills too early in their careers against opponents that were too good. He was the biggest matchmaker in the North, and as a manager, he had the biggest stable of boxers, so it only made sense He'd use his own lads to get the 25% manager's fee. Some of the lads he'd managed had the potential to be champions, but they'd been rushed into bouts against fighters far superior too early in their careers and finished up skint beaten and terribly disillusioned. Lots of the lads I'd trained with as a kid had turned pro to Tommy, and they all said the same thing. But yet he had the effrontery to say Alex was a bad influence. I knew differently. Alex had been in whole jail, through the gates, along the wings and into the gym. For him to have been allowed, he'd have been checked meticulously by the police. Any shadow on his character, any whisper about his integrity, no matter how minor, would have left the governor no alternative but to have him stopped. Alex was spotless, which was more than I could say for Tommy. Now, though, in the autumn of my physical powers, he was probably the best manager I could have. He couldn't overmatch me, and I was sure to get plenty of fights. The stadium had been transformed from a seedy backstreet emporium into a five-star arena. The layout wasn't any different, the sides gently sloping to the ring in the centre. But the decor was. It sparkled with affluence and class. When I'd boxed there three times in a four-week period back in 73, in my bid to win the ABAs, the place had been a health hazard. The walls had been covered in flaking, faded, tobacco-stained emulsion. The seating had been ripped and had nails on the alert for trousers. The floor had been that of terraces after a football match. Above the ring, blackout curtains had dangled from the windows. Now the walls were gleaming white and all the aisles were covered in thick red carpet and the blackout curtains had been removed. It was the perfect setting for a world title fight. The capacity crowd weren't all that interested in the boxing, for watching the celebrities sitting in their seats, and others parading down the aisles to theirs. There were odd shouts of encouragement and occasional bursts of clapping, but no real interest. Not until Spinks and Peter Freeman, the central area heavyweight champion, entered the ring for the main supporting bout, and then pandemonium broke loose and didn't stop until the fight was over. Tommy had pulled out all the stops for me to fight Spinks. This was his first pro fight, as it would have been mine. When he hadn't succeeded, he'd got the central area champion to substitute. The country was divided into three areas, and Peter was the champion from Birmingham to the Scottish border. It meant one of three things. One, Tommy was up to his old tricks of overmatching. Two, he fancied I was better than Peter. Or three, He'd rather have me beaten up than him. It was over in the first minute, after Leon tore from his corner and set about Peter as if he was a punch bag, and for all the resistance he showed he may have been one. He slowly sank to his knees, and then toppled over, although in my book he hadn't been hit hard enough to put him on the deck. He collapsed from shock and fright and hadn't really been prepared to fight for keeps. It was a devastating performance from Leon, but he wouldn't beat me. I could feel it in my bones. He could win all the gold medals he wanted, and I hadn't had the gloves on in four years, but I'd back myself any day to beat him. The television people broadcasting live to America sent word to hold up the main event 
until they were back on schedule. Leon's destructive performance had thrown it out by half an hour. All the stadium lights came on as the MC, Nat Basso, began introducing stars and celebrities from the ring. One after the other, all Liverpool football players, past and present, it seemed to me, received rousing cheers. Any minute I expected Joe to be called, but as the stars became more and more obscure, and the cheers grew less and less, I realised it wasn't to be. It crossed my mind it could be, because he was sitting with Alex, and then realised it was people who were in the news now, and most of this mob wouldn't know Joe Gans from Mahatma Gandhi. Everybody in the place was a star, it appeared, but the people sitting on our row, judging from the stars Nat was finding, and I strongly suspected he'd have liked to brain Peter for not lasting the distance. But then word came the television people were ready. How word came, I'd no idea. The television cameras were high on the wall, above the main entrance, on a specially constructed platform, about thirty yards from the ring. But suddenly, everybody knew, as if by telepathy. Instantly the atmosphere changed, from a day at the seaside, to wait him for the eighth draw on the football coupon. The light slowly dimmed until it was pitch black, and then a spotlight stabbed from the TV platform to illuminate where the fighters would emerge. As it came on, the entire crowd gasped a breath of air, and then sat rigid in their seats. The seconds dragged as the tension increased. It was as if we were all watching the fuse burn on a giant stick of dynamite. It was electric palpable enough to fry eggs. The silence was only broken by the cameraman, high on the platform, whispering furtively, when suddenly a ripple of applause grew in a second to the roar of a jumbo jet. The stick of dynamite had exploded into cheering that was so loud I had to bend my head and put fingers in my ears to prevent them from hurting. The spotlight showed a group of fellas wearing white pullovers coming down the aisle with a black hood bobbing in the middle. Stan Hutchins, from Kalamazoo, Michigan, USA, challenging for the world light heavyweight title, danced from his corner to cheers louder and more prolonged than any I'd ever heard, and then the lights dimmed and went out. A minute crawled by, then another, the tension even greater than before, building by the instant, until it felt as if the very air was alive and living on the silence. This wasn't anything as common as a stick of dynamite. This was extraterrestrial. The spotlight trained on the tunnel never wavered. There wasn't anything I could see. Not a thing. When suddenly in unison, the entire crowd of five thousand erupted with a noise that lifted the top of my skull as though it were an egg. Once again I had to put fingers in my ears to stop the herd, and felt like shouting. I was used to silence, and hadn't adjusted yet especially when the noise lasted until Conte had been in the ring about a week. As they were being gloved, when the referee gave his instructions, I glanced about to see how the women were taking it. There were hundreds, all dressed as if they were at a film premiere, without exception, and for all their make-up and jewellery, their excitement radiated through to such a degree they could be drooling with saliva dripping from their chins. This was a contest between two grown men, who'd honed their basic instinct to perfection. This was to see who would survive. The rules that govern boxing, no hitting below the belt, no hitting behind the ears, kid people that boxing is civilised in a game like chess. The only places a boxer is allowed to hit are the only places worth hitting, and like chess, one makes a move, the other makes a move, but instead of winning or losing bishops and rooks, it's teeth and senses that are lost. Survivors lived to fight another day, and women loved survivors, and winners, and men prepared to fight. It was over in the third round, and Conte had successfully defended his crown with a move of infinite perfection. He'd been fractionally faster, but his strength had appeared brittle compared to Hutchins, and the longer it lasted the more I thought strength would tell. Hutchins threw a full-blooded right cross, and as his weight transferred from the back foot to his fist, Conte slipped his head fractionally to one side and waited with it positioned ready. Hutchins followed through, unable to avoid crashing his face into the top of Conte's forehead. 
right where a horn would grow, if he was a unicorn. But Jin stepped back bewildered, unable to comprehend how he'd been hit, with the right side of his face a crimson mask. Conte knew immediately it was over. He didn't leap in and take advantage before the ref could intervene and stop the fight. And I thought, regardless of the feelings of Michael and Dell, John Conte wasn't a bad fella at all. He was only in there to win and not inflict unnecessary injury. The sheer class of his winning move and how he'd held back made him more than a world champion in my book. John Conte was a sportsman and a humanist, and there are very few of them about. If I practised forever, I doubted I'd be able to execute such a move. It was something you had to be born with, and there was no way I could have held back like he had. The crowd were disappointed it hadn't lasted longer, although they cheered enough for my ears to begin hurting again. There was just the undercurrent in the roar, as though it were a lion that had killed a gazelle when it could eat a buffalo. The bloodlust sated, but not satisfied. The papers would say tomorrow, Conte had won after a clash of heads, inferring he'd either butted or fluked his victory, too blind to see the skill and daring of his move, like the people sitting in the front. One fella got a huge laugh with the comment, If only Roger Hunt could have used his head like Conte, we'd have won the league every year. Their blindness needled me. Alex and his pals had to rush to catch the last train, and couldn't stay for the closing bout. Let me know if anything develops, he instructed, shaking my hand in the foyer. Take care of yourself, and if you get any problems, just give me a ring. Joe wished me all the best, like old Mickey Connors, and then they all disappeared through the doors and into the night. With time to kill before Dell showed up, I thought it wise to show my face in the dressing room area, to keep Tommy sweet, and see if that too had been given a coat of restoration. The stadium was almost empty when I returned, the closing bout having no interest for anybody but the family and friends of the two fighters, and the atmosphere was that of an amateur show. The electricity was used up, and the battery flat. The dressing room area hadn't been titivated or decorated, or not since the blackout curtains had been installed. It was silent and sad, as if the short concrete floor with doors either side was the morgue for dead dreams. The stadium was known as the graveyard of champions, and even Conte's victory couldn't resurrect the dreams that had died here. Four years ago, I'd come along this corridor to the end dressing room, completely confident my future was assured, but now I wasn't sure at all. All the training in the world couldn't stop the clock, and I'd this rotten six months to get through first. Maybe old Tom would find me a job to keep me out of trouble, a nice steady job, training the lads he managed. It would suit me down to the ground. The door of a dressing room opened, and Peter appeared, carrying his hold all. Hello, Peter. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm not so bad, you know. He smiled self-consciously, embarrassed at his performance. Floyd Patterson, after his first defeat against Sonny Liston, had hidden in the dressing rooms and left the arena hidden under a beard, so Peter's feelings were natural, but very unpleasant. I was glad it wasn't me. His face had a red patch high on the cheekbone, but it was the only mark on him. I wasn't fit, you know. I mean, if I hadn't been skint, I wouldn't have taken it, Peter explained. I couldn't turn down six hundred pounds, could I? No, Peter, you couldn't turn down money like that. He pushed himself from the wall and called, See you then, over his shoulder, and disappeared round the corner into the arena. It was a lot of money, far more than I'd realised. If I'd fought instead of him, it would be in my pocket now, and in the next six months I'd have another six fights and be earning fortunes. It sickened me that somebody with Peter's attitude had been given the opportunity, while I had to wait. There was somebody coming, footsteps sounded, and then tonight's promoter, Mr Manny Goodall, appeared in the corridor. I recognised him instantly from his photo in the papers, and I'd heard him speak on the radio. If you play for pennies, that's all you'll win, he'd said. In answer to a question about fears, the show would flop, holding it in the stadium. Hello, Paul. He drew deeply on a tipped cigarette, as if it was giving him life, and then blew the smoke through his nose. It twitched sideways like a rabbit's. Hello, Mr Goodall. I smiled. It looks like you had a success tonight. 
a full house. The headaches, you wouldn't believe the headaches. He weighed me up like I was a second-hand car he was thinking of buying. Tommy tells me you'll be boxing yourself soon, start of next season. All being well, I will be, he grinned hopefully. Hope so, Paul, the game's almost dead, it's crying out for some new blood. He swivelled on his heel in a cloud of smoke and returned the way come without a backward glance or another word. How did he know me? I hadn't been in the national papers or on the radio. How the fucking hell did he know me? After a minute's deep thinking, I had the answer, or I bet my life I had. When Tommy had come to the beach back in 73, he'd invited me to watch his heavyweight sensation in action that night in some hall up the North Shore, the Blackpool Sportsman's Guild, or a name similar. Peter had been in with Guinea Roger at the top of the bill, and he'd fought then as if he'd been frightened of being hit. He should have walked in and battered Guinea Roger like Spinks had done with him tonight. I'd shouted for him to steam in. He was two stones heavier, and Roger couldn't hit anyway. I'd sparred with him a week or two earlier in some North London gym. The sweat, the smell, the memory came flooding back as though it was yesterday. It had been some enormous barn of a place, with donkey men, ice cream, rock, candy floss, t-shirt print, tea stall owners, all sitting four to a table wearing ancient evening suits, clapping politely between rounds and telling me to be quiet as though it was the National Sporting Club and they were only there to appreciate the aesthetics of the game. Mind you, I did say I'd batter the pair of them and told them all to bollocks off before I'd left the place in disgust. Manny had been one of those I'd told to bollocks off. No, no, had he hell, he'd been the promoter. Yes, that's right, he'd been the promoter, and Tommy had been his matchmaker, just like tonight. It all came back with startling clarity. Tommy holding his air in place on the beach. The phony crowd, the phony boxing, the phony clapping, the whole charade. It had been a typical Blackpool sideshow, and nothing to do with fighting at all. Yes, and not just that. They were the ones who had stopped me from boxing and were making me wait now. They were both on the board of control, and they'd inferred, well, Tommy had, box on our shores or you won't box at all. Now the penny had dropped. I remembered Leon Spinks had exactly the same corner men Hutchins had. Two little black fellas and another much younger one. They were in the swindle too. The whole lot was one big swindle. No, it wasn't. Conte and Hutchins had been trying and so had many of the others on the bill. But Peter hadn't, and he was their star man. It was a knocking bet I'd fight him once I started, and when I did, there would have to be some changes made. I wasn't any sideshow. The whole business made me itch as though a spider was crawling up my back. Manny Goodall, big-time promoter, smoking tipped cigarettes and wearing a rumpled brown suit on the night of his biggest success, and on about headaches, like a donkeyman on a rainy bank holiday Monday. It was enough to make anybody itch. What made it worse, these were the people who said Alex was a bad influence. I'd need all his help with this mob when I did start. On my way from the stadium, with Nat announcing the winner of the last bout, and requesting those remaining to stand for the national anthem, I remembered Peter had been on £600 that night too. It had to be his going rate, I thought and decided I wanted more than him, I was worth it. It wasn't until I walked into Dell and some backstreet blues did I stop thinking about the discovery I'd made tonight. Manny, Tommy, Nat Basso, the Americans, the referee, the seconds, every man jack of them were in on the conspiracy but the boxers. No, even Peter was in the conspiracy. Alex was of the same opinion and said they weren't paid enough to try. That's why he hadn't been allowed a promoter's licence. They were afraid. They were frightened he would capture the market, and boxers would only box on his promotions, and they would have to pay better purses if they wanted to compete. The only kids who'd given their all were the young lads coming through, and the old plodders who really enjoyed a fight, the lads who made up the bill on every show. They'd never be champions, although one would occasionally drop lucky like Richard Dunn which would renew the hopes of them all. It was the likes of him who kept them all living in hope. Richard Dunn, 
had won the British heavyweight title from Bunny Johnson one miserable Tuesday night in some club in Manchester, which rated six lines in the Daily Mirror. The standard of boxing had dropped so low. Johnson, the British heavyweight champion, was thirteen stone wet through and less than six foot tall. A Jamaican had come over to live in Handsworth, Birmingham, and get a living boxing. After I'd sparred with Guinea Roger, I'd sparred with Johnson. He wasn't big enough to make an impression, but what he lacked in size he made up for with determination. Long comes done, six foot three inches, fifteen stone plus, and pokes out a points win, and the next thing, he's fighting for the European title against a seven foot bean pole who found reindeer in Lapland. Dunn grits his teeth for a round and a half and flattens the fella, and then the press starts screaming he could beat Ali. The big Yorkshireman is suddenly a paratrooper, a high rise scaffolder, a fella who's been about a bit. Ali is fat and old and ready to be taken. Dunn finds himself fighting Ali in Munich, and it isn't a dream. He really has hit the jackpot. He tries his best for a while, really believing he can win, then slowly realises Ali on crutches with an arm in a sling is too good, and loses heart. Reality sinks home with a half a dozen punches in the blink of an eye, and he's out. But it doesn't end there. He fights Bugner on the strength of the world title fight, and is in the big money once again. All the young lads, on the undercards of every show, live in the hope it will happen to them, but unless they were signed up with the right people it never would. How many of them were aware of this nasty little fact of boxing politics? And if they were, how many cared? Peter certainly didn't, the fraud. Well, I wasn't. I'd do it on merit, or I wouldn't do it at all. At the moment, I could beat the current crop of heavyweights in this country without having to train, and probably the Europeans too, providing I could stay fit and wasn't injured. No way did I want to be on a Blackpool sideshow, poncing about like Big Daddy or Giant Haystacks, and the only way to make sure was to flatten everybody and get in the big league. I had everything, good wind, able to fight or box, as much bottle as it takes, but I was growing old and all the old injuries were catching up. I had no alternative but to go along with them if I wanted to turn all the years of training I'd done into money. But there was this six months to get through first. Once it was over, and people saw I was genuine, the following I'd have would be tremendous, and it would grow. The likes of Manny Goodall and Tommy Miller wouldn't be able to hold me back. The stadium flashed into mind. The World Boxing Council had ordered it to be cleaned up or the fight would be cancelled. Manny Goodall had been going to put the fight on in the muck and squalor, the penny-pinching snide. No wonder he wears brown suits and smokes tip cigarettes. Six months to get through and when I have, the reward will be to join his act. Behave and prove you're honest enough to join the swindle. It wouldn't be for long, I thought. Groping my way in the dark behind Dell in some club ten minutes after leaving the stadium, it was like walking into a stone wall about chest height and waking up. For what use my senses were, I may as well have been asleep. The noise coming from two enormous loudspeakers was deafening. My ears overloaded once more in the space of an hour, and my eyes were blinded by a kaleidoscope of colours coming from a million tiny spotlights dancing everywhere. The smell of humanity in all its glory clogged my nose. Sweat and smoke, scent and sex, when instantly everything was knocked into focus. Dell had stopped before a table where Anita was sitting. I could see her over the top of his head. All my senses became alert and stood to attention. In the few seconds we looked at each other, both knowing what the outcome of this meeting would be, I took in her perfectly round afro, her flawless skin texture, her dazzling teeth, her milk-white eyes, and thought of Pauline. I'll leave you two for a minute, Del said. There's somebody I want to see. Won't be long. We were alone in the small cave of silence, about a yard from the dance floor, with the place heaving with people. Everybody, it seemed, was black, or had a good portion of negro blood, from jet to Anita's coffee colour but they were mere shadows to the startling brightness of Pauline's memory. It was Pauline who was sitting before me, and the deep probing scar she'd left wasn't healed, 
and the memory still hurt. It was the pain of a relapse. Compared to Anita, she was an old banger, a used and battered old mortar. I even recalled making her wear a wig and false nails to smarten her up before we'd married, like polishing the car before it's sold. What a full bouncing cunt I'd been to fall in love and leave myself open to all the agony that followed. It wouldn't happen again, although to fall in love with Anita wouldn't be difficult. She was breathtaking. Pauline had said in one of her dear Johns another excuse for being unfaithful. It wouldn't have worked anyway because I was too old. If she could see me now, I thought, recovering rapidly from the memory and realising it was the music making the row and not the clock above the prison gate, she would be gutted, sick as a parrot. Never again would I be blinded by dazzling teeth and milk-white eyes. Anyway, Pauline had rotten cruel eyes the colour of fish. I should have known. All the signs were there, but I'd been blind. Dell came back after a while, very businesslike and full of importance. His manner, when he didn't want interrupting, bristling with contained power to make people wary. On this occasion, Anita. Right, it's all arranged, he said. You can move in whenever. It's handy, very central, but you'll have to share. Your own bedroom and all that. And there's bags of room, and they're two nice lads. Just muck in. Anita came back with me to Blackpool that night, where we stayed in a boarding house posing as a hotel on Central Drive. We went into the 007, a nightclub where I'd often taken Pauline, just to dispel any thoughts the regulars may have we were still together, and moved into the flat the following day. Anita, five foot ten and nineteen years old, with the looks and figure of a playboy centre page, was followed by Patsy, another Liverpool girl, equally gorgeous, and only eighteen years old. Lily, Patsy's mate, was the next, and then Anne, an old friend and a divorcee. The two lads whose flat it was, a van driver and a typesetter, didn't mind whom I brought, providing they made no snide comments about their relationship. They were desperately in love, and couldn't help kissing and stroking each other's crutch every time they passed, which amounted to at least twenty times a day. It didn't bother me, and I wish they wouldn't do it in the kitchen, but I didn't say anything. Life zipped by, like the needle skidding across a record, in a tumble of events and incidents too numerous to mention. Every day seemed a month long, until after two weeks I was thinking I'd been out of jail years so much had happened, when I realised it was time I went home and settled into a routine. After years of the same dull colours, the same monotonous noises, the same hours of everything, brushing teeth, using the toilet, sleeping, working, it takes a while, and I found the best indicator was my bowel movement. Like everything, the food was exactly the same, week in, week out. Every Tuesday, tea the same, every Saturday, dinner, every meal of every week, tallied down to the last slice of bread. The sudden influx of food solid enough to chew, nothing is served in prison that makes the use of a knife and fork necessary, and I'd often thought having teeth was superfluous to the needs in jail, but now having to chew not only made my jaws ache, but bunged up my system. My first discharge from prison had caused me to feel worse than I'd ever done. I'd gone a full week without using the toilet, and when I had, in a girl's flat, I'd blocked up the plumbing, and almost faded away from embarrassment. Now my bowels were in order, and when they were in order, then the rest of me was. It was time to find a routine, and where better than with my family at home.